Is Jesus First Love, episode number 85. You can be, you can be a New Testament Christian. That's the main theme of episode 85. I know for a fact that you can be a New Testament Christian. How can I be so certain? Jesus. For without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. There's a flip side to those words of Jesus, which is, for with me, you can do everything. If without me, you can do nothing, then with me, you can do everything. Without being relationally attached to Jesus, we can do nothing. Being strongly attached to Jesus, we can do everything. And being moderately attached to Jesus, we can do some things, but not everything. Of course, everything is everything within the will of our God. That which is outside the will of God most certainly cannot be attained through his Son. It is the will of God that you be a New Testament type of Christian. It is the will of your God that you be a New Testament type of Christian. What is a New Testament Christian? Well, let's look at it. Jesus at the Last Supper. This cup is the new covenant of my blood. The twelve were certainly not expecting this. You see, when they did the Passover feast, they were celebrating the Passover feast. Jesus knew that within a few hours, he was going to be arrested. And within the day, he was going to be crucified. <laughs> so there's Jesus at the Last Supper celebrating the Passover feast. And then he said these words after the meal, after the Passover meal. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now you must understand nobody, nobody added anything to the Passover meal. Nobody. It just wasn't done. So the 12 were certainly not expecting those words. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he lifted up a cup, a cup of wine. Okay. <clears throat> May it be fully understood that a New Testament Christian is a new covenant Christian. Remember the words of Jesus. This cup is the new covenant of my blood. A New Testament Christian or a New Testament type of Christian is a New Covenant Christian. That is one who lives by the New Covenant. Hebrews 8 and 6. He, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. That's Hebrews 8 and 6. A better covenant? Better than what? Better than the old covenant that God established with the Israelites through Moses. How is the new covenant better than the old covenant? The new covenant is established on better promises than the old covenant. And the old covenant consisted of many promises and those promises to be fulfilled depended on the obedience of his people, the Israelites. And they failed. Oh, generally speaking, they, they failed. They failed, they failed terribly. 
The new covenant consists of promises obtained on our behalf by Jesus Christ. The new covenant consists of promises obtained on our behalf by Jesus Christ. You are a new covenant person and you will be a new covenant person for all eternity. You became a new covenant person when you adhered yourself to Jesus. This covenant was established by Jesus Christ with his father. Innocent blood was required to ratify the covenant. There has never been innocent blood since Adam and Eve, and their blood became contaminated through sin, just like that. In the entirety of the human race, there is not a sacrifice that could ratify the new covenant. There is not a person that could ratify the new covenant because nobody had innocent blood. Nobody until Jesus, your Jesus. Hebrews 4 and 15 tells us, although Jesus was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin, the blood of Jesus was innocent blood. Innocent blood is powerful blood, able to ratify the new covenant. Again, you are a new covenant person. You may not act like a new covenant person. You may not even know that you are a new covenant person. But if you have been born of the Spirit, you are in fact, a new covenant man or a new covenant woman. A person who behaves like a new covenant person is a New Testament type of person, akin to many of the Old Testament persons. A person who behaves like a new covenant person is a New Testament type of person. Many like the earliest church persons. You can be a New Testament person. How? Jesus. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So says your Jesus. Paul, obviously, was a New Testament brother in Christ. And Paul said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Those who imitate Christ are New Testament Christians. Notice Paul never said, follow me. He simply said, imitate me. Unlike denominations, Paul didn't want Christians to follow him. He wanted Christians to follow Christ. And I'm just going to interject there. I want you to follow Christ. Like Paul, I want you to follow Christ. <laughs> That's what this podcast is all about, to get you to stop following Christians and to start following Christ. Okay. Paul didn't want Christians to follow him. He wanted Christians to follow Christ. This because Paul himself, a faithful follower of Christ of Jesus. And I'm going to interject this thought again. So am I. I'm a follower of Jesus. If I weren't a follower of Jesus, I wanted, I might want you to follow me or somebody else. If I, if I was a follower of something else, I'd want to, I'd want you to be a favor. I I'd want you to bunch with us bunch. Okay. Jesus to Peter and Andrew. Okay, remember now, Paul was a follower of Christ. Jesus to Peter and Andrew, follow me. Jesus to Philip, follow me. Jesus to another of his disciples, 
follow me. Jesus to a tax collector, follow me. Jesus to all his disciples, follow me. Jesus to a rich young ruler, follow me. Jesus said to all who serve him, all who serve him, follow me. And Jesus says to you through his most Holy Spirit, do you have ears to hear? Follow me. If you follow Christ, you will be a New Testament Christian. And if you don't, you won't. Segment one, relationship, relationship, relationship. Ask yourself, who am I following? Am I following Jesus or am I following Christians? You know you are a you know you are following Jesus if you are a soul winner. Jesus said to fishermen, to two fishermen, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men are followers of Christ. Followers of Christ are fishers of men. Hmm? <laughs> Those following another have no interest or empathy for the perishing. John 15, 5. He who abides in me bears much fruit. Abiders in Christ will bring many to heaven with them. Abiders in others or another will bring maybe a few with them and maybe none at all. Section two, the judgment seat of Christ. Will we be able to witness the encounters between Judge Jesus and early church Christians as the, at the judgment seat of, of Jesus? Such as Paul and Timothy and the 11 and the 70 and many, many etc. I don't know. Will you witness my encounter with Judge Jesus? Will I witness yours? I don't know, but I knew, do know that New Testament type of Christians will receive considerable rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And I also know that cultural Christians will receive few rewards, perhaps none at all. Segment three, does Jesus hate evangelicalism? <laughs> Hmm. To become an evangelical, one must commit spiritual adultery. Adultery. One must betray Jesus. One must dethrone Jesus and enthrone another in his place. One must exchange commandments of God with commandments of men. One must choose evangelical traditions over the sayings of Jesus Christ. Segment four, only stupid people go to hell. I'm going to talk about hopelessness, real hopelessness. Now, I'm directing this to non-Christians or to even those who do not know if they are Christians, if their names really are, have been added to the book of life. There's a solution. There's a solution. <laughs> if you're not sure, just make one sincere prayer to Jesus Christ. Deposit all who you are into who he is and receive all who he is into who you are. It's that simple. And if you are born again already, what pro what's the problem? And if you're not, you will be. One sincere prayer. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about my friend Richard. Okay, probably every one of us, Richard and I, we did this article together in the main issue. And uh, I've read this before, I think, in past, past episodes. I'm going to read it again. And probably sometime in the future, I'll read it again. It is, it's a fascinating account. Okay. Um, probably every one of us, this is me, my writing, probably every one of us have asked ourselves, is hell real? Could such a place really exist? 
It would be difficult to find one radio, television, or newspaper commentator <clears throat> who would suggest that the Bible, what the Bible calls hell, really exists, even those few who claim to believe the Bible is true. Most people avoid the subject. When was the last time you heard people speak on this matter? When was the last time you had a conversation about what the, the Bible calls the lake of fire? And many church people, even some born-again church people, do not believe in a literal hell, but pass it off as an allegory. To them, the story of our Lord Jesus, that our Lord Jesus related to us about Lazarus and the rich man, whereby both ended up in different regions of Hades, one, reason, one region being a place of peace and tranquility, and the other being a region of unspeakable torment, was merely a parable. A friend once told me something like this, we know God is love, and therefore we must look at scripture from that perspective. God, you see, cannot create and send people to hell because the Bible says God is love. I told my friend that is exactly the wrong way to look at scripture. We must accept the Bible for what it says unless the meaning is clearly seen to be symbolic. Even when the Bible says something abhorrent, which it sometimes does, we cannot pass it off as something figurative. After all, the Most Holy Spirit himself is the author. The Spirit of Truth speaks truth and only truth. And yet, is the hell the Lord Jesus described and supported by other New Testament writings actual or symbolic? Richard was one of those most sincere and authentic Christians I have ever known. At his funeral, I called him my closest friend. He was never exaggerative, rarely reflected attention unto himself, and his knowledge of scripture was most impressive. Looking back, Richard was a God-sent elder. Of course, he never called or even considered himself an elder, and at the time, I never thought of him as such, just a friend, and because the term elder was only in the context of a local church, nobody would recognize him as such. But an elder he was, and a serious and faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus he was. So, all that to say, Richard had a vision, a momentous vision that shook him to the core. Richard did not see hell, as other people have so claimed, but he did feel the hopelessness of hell. There was a time I produced a newspaper-sized periodical, the main issue, and delivered it throughout my city of Kelowna, about 38,000 copies. The topic of one of the issues of this paper was heaven and hell. Please read and heed Richard's testimony. Please, <laughs> speaking to non-Christians, please, please. Okay, here it goes. This is Richard. It was about 16 years ago, and my wife Rachel and I were at a Sunday evening service at the Rutland Gospel Tabernacle Church. The pastor had preached a message about the reality of a literal hell. I had heard this same word before from other preachers, yet I listened intently. The service over, most people were headed for home when I noticed a Christian brother kneeling at the front of the church by himself. I discerned that he was struggling, so I joined him. What happened next is hard to put into words, but I feel I must try. I've got something very important to say, and I ask you, to hear me. I was suddenly taken into the spiritual realm, into the place, into the, the place of departed souls, those who had died without receiving Christ as their Savior. God let me feel what they felt. I experienced the agony of eternal separation from God. And it is this sense of eternal hopelessness that I am trying to convey. The feelings, the emotions of hopelessness, I cannot describe. 
the despair, the anger, uh, the agony of separation, I cannot fully relate, but I felt them, tasted of them. No, I didn't feel the torment of flames. Jesus spared me that, but a total separation from the one who can save and deliver. And I was made to feel what it's like to have rejected him and be in the situation of never being able to accept him. For the opportunity had slipped by. There is no redeemer in hell. That life, the life in hell, has no savior, no redeemer. It is this life, life on earth, that has hope. This life has opportunity. This life offers a time to change. Only in this life is there redemption. In this life, we set our eternal destinies. In hell, there are no choices. The time of decisions is past. One is conscious of one's past life, conscious of what, what once was, but fully aware that it was now all over all over. In that spiritual encounter, I had this sense that I was taken down, and I could only look back up with memories of what once was. But I couldn't go back. I no longer had choices. Before, there was always a chance I had a Redeemer, even if I rejected him. At least there was hope. I could always choose him if I wanted. But now, there was no Redeemer to save me. Cry as I might, no one would rescue me. I became totally aware that the Redeemer is for life on earth, not life after death. The souls here had no hope. I know I, that I keep on saying those words, no hope, hopelessness. Oh, what grief, oh, what sorrow. I cried out loud in that church. I screamed The people who had not yet gone home after the service looked on amazed, not knowing what was happening to me. And why was this happening? Sermons were fine, but often they don't affect us as they should. God wanted, to, wanted me to know what the lost people felt. He wanted me to experience eternal hopelessness. Perhaps I lacked compassion for the unsaved. It certainly gave me an appreciation of my salvation. I thank God I have made my peace with him. I had long ago accepted Jesus Christ as my eternal Savior. I know my sins are forgiven, and my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have found redemption through his shed blood for my guilt and iniquities. I am not ashamed of being called by his name and to confess him as Lord. I so appreciate what he did for me at the cross. He made a way of escape for every one of us. Hell was something I was casual about, but my experience has forever changed me. What was just words on pages of Holy Scripture, I have felt for myself in this experience. But praise God, I also have experienced forgiveness and the joy of knowing my destiny is now in God's loving hands and my future is in heaven with my Redeemer. Just a note, Jesus, <laughs> Richard, is right now with his Redeemer in heaven. But what about you? Richard asks. I want you to know there is no such thing as hopelessness in this life. You may think that you have sinned too much. You may think that you are beyond God's mercy, but you're not. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's the issue. Christ is the issue. It doesn't matter what you feel. Feelings come and feelings go, but rather what you decide. What is your decision? What will you do with Jesus? And that's the end of Richard's writings and two things I want to add to Richard's article. First, there are many people in hell who simply procrastinated. They would make a decision for Christ later, maybe tomorrow. Tell me, 
If you won't accept Jesus and his awesome salvation now, what makes you think you will receive him later? Second point, sincerity is required. Lord Jesus is passionate towards you. He really, really is. And he doesn't like you being lukewarm and half-hearted toward him. Make a, a sincere decision for Christ or don't make a decision at all. Okay? Segment 5, LarryJones.ca One reason, now back to mostly Christians, evangelicals. This podcast is directed mostly to evangelicals. One reason I want you to feed on LarryJones.ca is because in doing so, you will receive more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. My writings will affect you. My writings will make you aware of something that you have not been aware of, that you are going to appear before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. And another reason I want you to feed on LarryJones.ca, your catch, your catch will be enlarged. You will become a fishers of men. You see, if I can convince you, I go back to this. I believe, I'm of the opinion, that 95% of born-again Christians have departed from first love, the Lord Jesus. And they, be, they, they move from being very effective to being ineffective. They move from being a bright light to a dim light. And if I can convince one of the 95% to return to Christ, this time permanently, that person will bring with them not just dozens, but hundreds and perhaps thousands, perhaps thousands with them in heaven. That's why I want you to read, feed on LarryJones.ca. Six, segment six, let my people go. I read from Wayne Jacobson, chapter three. Oh, from his book, Finding Church, which I, I hope you will read someday. And if you'd be like me, you'd read it more like more than once. Okay, he writes, Wayne writes, gossip and conflict, conflict divided people. Gossip and conflict divided people. And most of those who aspired to lead us during those various groups evidenced serious character flaws leading to sordid affairs, both sexual and financial. I found it disheartening that one could know so much about Jesus without being shaped by his life. Hmm. Segment seven, prayer time. I pray for you, you pray for me. <laughs> I just said earlier, Jesus doesn't like lukewarmness. <clears throat> and I'm going to pray with all the sincerity I can muster. I love the Father. I don't visit the Father. I don't visit Jesus. <laughs> The Father and, the Je and Jesus more and more and more abide in me and I and them. So what I'm saying is that I think sincerity comes easier, comes easy to me. And um, if my prayers weren't sincere, <laughs> they wouldn't do you any good whatsoever. So I pray for you, my blood wash brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, I pray. I pray, Lord, that they would not be at the judgment seat of Christ. They would not be in that huge sea of people that both Richard and 
the author of The Judgment Seat of Christ, Rick, I pray, Lord, that we that sea of people that were so distraught at the judgment seat, I pray that those that now, those Christians that now have their hand lifted to you, Lord Jesus, I pray that they would not be part of this group. They would be part of that group that was rejoicing, rejoicing because they received so many rewards at the judgment seat. I pray that you do a work for them now. I pray, Father, that you would not let them forget. Lord, not, uh, not let them forget that they must appear before your Son, to whom you gave full authority. They must appear before your Son, Jesus. Don't let them forget them, Lord. And pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom to repair, to prepare themselves. And I thank you. I pray for the non-Christians, Lord. I pray that they would take Richard's testimony, which is, which is being sent in many, many places in the world. They would take that Richard's testimony seriously. And they wouldn't wait till tomorrow because for some, tomorrow won't come. I pray, the, I pray for them, Lord, that they would make a now decision for your son Jesus and Lord Jesus my master my shepherd my rabbi my teacher my God my creator my sin bearer my deliverer my healer Jesus I ask you Jesus I ask you Jesus that to the degree that episode 85 contained truth to that degree you would confirm truth with signs and wonders and miracle healings. Lord Jesus, I believe you want us to pray largely, and I pray largely. I don't pray, Lord, that some would receive healing. I don't pray, Lord, that some, that most with upraised hand to you would receive healing, but I pray that everyone would receive healing. Everyone that's in need would receive healing and everyone would receive protection. Teach me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, teach me to appropriate your blood on their behalf. Teach me, Lord, as I've asked you many times, teach me that scripture verse, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Teach me, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, you pray for me, okay? Just a few seconds. Not a few minutes, just a few seconds. And I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. God bless you, and catch you next time. Oh, yes, I remember what my friend said. Tell them all the time to comment, to like, to subscribe. That's what I just did. <laughs> God bless you.